So a lot of places have books set up in some places, but not up. Yeah. I think yours is there, and mine isn't. So mine might be. everyone here at uh, Harbor Center, uh, Harbor Center, the SFU Harbor Center uh, area, and all the people who are live streaming, welcome to you. Um, we are here today to discuss uh, plotting and pantsing. My name is Iona Wishaw, and I'll be both moderating and participating today. I want to remind you that you can purchase books throughout the festival at the different publisher tables and also through Iron Dog, which I believe has a bookstore set up somewhere here. And you can also meet authors at the signing tables. And finally, of course, you can donate to the festival through the website and participate in our silent auction uh, at wordvancouver.com. Uh, I would like to, and we would like to, acknowledge that this festival takes place on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Uh, there are uh, a, a festival like this, uh, which is available to absolutely anybody who walks in the door, is not possible without heaps of sponsors. So just, uh, I'm just going to read a few. Thank you to SFU and the Writer Studio for this space. Uh, the Canada Arts Council, the Canada Book Fund, the Canada Heritage Fund, uh, the Canada Periodical Fund, the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, Creative BC. You can see there's a huge uh, range of people. And of course, for this one, the Canadian Crime Writers Association, you can see a full list of all the people who so generously uh, made this event possible today. Uh, I'm, what I'm hoping to do is have a discussion about this topic and then hopefully leave uh, time for some questions at the end, should you have any. Today, I am joined by the following wonderful authors in no particular order. Plotter, J.T. Siemens, moved to Vancouver to become a personal trainer, but feels fortunate to have discovered his true love, writing crime fiction. After studying screenwriting at Capilano University, he followed up with creative writing at the University of BC and Simon Fraser. To those who killed me, um, his first book um, uh, in the Sloan Donovan series, uh, this was nominated for the Arthur Ellis Unhanged Award and published by New West Press earlier this year. His short fiction has appeared in Mystery Week Weekly, Down in the Dirt, and CC and D. Plotter, Elizabeth Bass, <laughs> is uh has written over 40 novels of mystery romance and women's fiction under her pseudonym liz ireland she is the author of mrs claus and the cozy mystery series um here in uh, shown and um 
This features uh, the title character, Solving Murders in Santa Land. Her award-winning Louise Falk historical mystery series was written under the pen name of Liz Freeland. She currently makes her home on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Panzer, Tara Moss, is a best-selling author, documentary host, and award-winning human rights and disability advocate. She's written 14 books, published in 19 countries in a dozen languages. Her latest is The Ghosts of Paris, set in 1947 and following up from international best-selling historical crime novel, The War Widow, featuring feminist P.I. Billy Walker. Moss is UNICEF ambassador and recipient of an Edna Ryan Award for his significant contribution to feminist debate. And in 2017, she was recognized um, as one of the global top 50 diversity figures in public life. In 2020, she was chosen as a global change maker by Conscious Being Magazine for her disability and chronic pain activist, and was recently um, a, on the was an honorary citizen received an honorary citizen award from the city of Victoria for her work on accessibility rights. And finally, myself, Iona Wishaw. I grew up in uh, oh, and I should say I'm a pantser. I grew up in Canada, Arizona, and Mexico. I have an MFA from UBC. I publish short fiction, poetry, and children's lit, and I'm the winner of the 2021 Bonnie Blythe Light Mystery Award and a finalist for the Duffy Book Prize and the Lefty Awards. The ninth book in the series, Framed in Fire, was released in April 2022 and it has been on the bestseller list since it came out. A passion for history and my family's World War II intelligent work informs the spirit of my period novels. So, pantsing and plotting. Generally, a glib sort of shorthand for these two broad ways that mystery authors work is as a plotter, that is someone who works out most or all the major and sometimes many of the subplot uh, details in advance before the actual writing of the book begins. And they may also do full character workups in advance of writing as well. Pantsers, on the other hand, generally uh, are considered to be people who just sit down and begin to write and see where it all takes them and uh, are guided in their plotting perhaps more by um, what's going on with their characters. So I hope to learn more about uh, that as we go today. These are the general definitions, but I'm sure every writer is somewhere on the continuum and many of us plants from time to time. Um, the really good news, if you're sitting out there wishing you could start writing mystery stories, there's really no right way to do it. Um, it's what you're inclined for, with. Um, so what kind of famous writers fall into these two categories? In the plotter category, you have John Grisham, uh, Elizabeth George, and someone like J.K. Rowling. In the pantser category, uh, self-declared pantsers are Donna Leon, Anne Cleves, and Ian Rankin. Today we have a real treat, two plotters, two pantsers, and we're going to have a discussion about how we write our mysteries. I have read all of the books uh, by these wonderful authors, and I honestly cannot tell if it's plotted or pantsed. So I think that's quite interesting. Uh, I see suggestions that whether you are one or the other is very much intrinsic and really a character trait. Can you tell us which one you are and do you have a sense of why that is? Let's start with Liz. Okay, well, I'm a plotter. Um, if it's intrinsic, um, it's because I lack any kind of self-confidence. So when I'm facing writing a book, I want to have as much framework underneath me as I possibly can. And otherwise, I get panicked and, and freeze. And so that's really the basis of why I plot. Also, because my publisher asked for an outline before I sell a book. So that also has a lot to do with it. And I'm always surprised um, at pantsers who are working for publishers and don't they, doesn't your um, publisher ask you for an outline? No. They don't? They, they just ask for a book. They might not get what they ask for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, yeah, I get asked for outlines, but the end book is always substantially different. Yeah. It's going to be the same characters in the same year, but it's not necessarily going to be the same plot. Yeah, exactly. So interestingly, Liz, uh, in some ways, plotting frees you up to write. Oh, absolutely. It's like having a net beneath you at your 
you know, is if you're a circus performer, you want to have the net so you can, you know, let yourself go. Um, that's how I see an outline. It really just makes me able to just not worry about the fact that I, 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 I would worry about the fact that I wouldn't be able to get to the end or that I would write for a thousand pages before I solved the mystery. I know when I start that there is a way through to the end and yeah. I've got it worked out. But sometimes I end up veering quite a bit. And then yeah. sometimes I'll have to stop halfway through and kind of um, outline backward. Yeah, so we'll get to some of those details. I think that's very interesting. Um, uh, now, can you, you're also a plotter, Jeremy, can you tell us uh, a little bit about are you intrinsic and why you do it? Um, yes, I, I'm not an intrinsic plotter. As a matter of fact, I should preface this whole thing by saying that I've written three books with an outline so far. We'll publish one. Second one is uh, due to be published in a couple in 2024, and I'm working on the third. All have been outlined. Um, however, number four, I'm going to switch camps, and I'm going to I'm going to go over to the pantser side. Uh, there's number number of, number of reasons. Why. I'm going to try it anyway. It's scary, but it's it's good to it's good to be scared every once in a while. Um, the first when I first wrote uh, to those who killed me, I. I was dimly aware that people did outlines, but I, at that time I wasn't hanging out with any novelists. I had no connections. I didn't even tell anybody that I was writing a, a novel until I didn't want to say anything else until it was done. And I dove, I dove in. <clears throat> um, I had an idea. I had uh, characters. I'd written a short story based on the main character and on, on the inciting incident. And I had done a series of short stories from the perspectives of the main characters. So I had a pretty good idea of the characters' voices, but no real, no, no outline to speak of whatsoever. And I wrote Pedal to the Metal. Um, I, I wrote, turned out the first draft in about three and a half months. And um, and I knew it had a strong beginning and a, and a, and a fairly solid end. Uh, I had the, the end was in mind from the from the start. And <clears throat> um, but, but I knew there was trouble in the middle, that muddle in the middle, as it's called. And and how I linked things out was very tenuous and it was very it was over overly complicated in spots. And I took my first crime writing workshop with a guy named William Deverell. And it was a week long intensive. And he basically, he said, you've got something here. But, and, but he just, he dissected it toward apart along with my, my classmates. And uh, he strongly suggested that I go back to the beginning, write an outline and start over. And I did not want to do that. That was not, didn't sound like fun at all. I just wanted to fix little bits here and there. But I knew it was too big for that. The, the, the structural problems were too, were, were too grand, and so I took the key scenes, which are still are still there, and um, characters, of course, and uh, the elements. And I, I took a month. I took a month. That's what I did. What, what Bill suggested, uh, and I wrote a 25 to 30 page outline. And it sucks. Uh, <laughs> I don't enjoy that part of the process at all. And that's part of the reason why I want to kind of shelve it for a little bit because. Um, I love all other aspects of writing, but that part is kind of miserable uh, for me. So in the future, if I do an outline, it'll be a very rough one, with tons of notes, tons of research. You know, do I do all I front load all my research and everything. So by the time I sit down to write that first draft, I have a pretty solid idea of where I'm going, hopefully. But I want to take a more adventurous, adventurous approach this time. Well, we have people here who might help with that. Uh, Tara, I, I should mention Panzer, by the way. The name comes from flying by the seat of your. Um, so Tara, please talk to us about pantsing. About pantsing. So for me, it's 23 years of being a professional writer and 23 years of aspiring to be a plotter. <laughs> I, I am a failed plotter in the sense that um, the pantsing always takes over. And I guess I've begun in time to accept that that's going to happen, but that the plotting actually needs to happen first as well. Um, I'm obsessive about my research, kind of famously so, sometimes called a forensic tourist, because I go into morgues, I see autopsies, I've been set on fire for research, I've been choked unconscious for research, do not try this at home, <laughs> folks, please do not try this at home all to kind of get as close as possible to the experiences of my characters. I've got my private investigator's license. I've you know, spent time with cops and, and, and do that kind of work so I can know it well. So my research informs the work probably you know, at the top tier. It's really about immersing myself completely. 
the plotting I try for during that process, because as I'm researching, I'm going, oh, this is really cool. I'd like to include this. I'd like my characters to go through that. But inevitably, during the writing process, I discover that I'm actually not building something. I am uncovering something. So for me, the writing process is sort of the, the opposite, if you will, that it, it might be as an approach from some other writers in that I feel a bit more like an archeologist than a builder. I'm, I'm like digging away and finding the story. It's as if it already exists, perhaps even as if I've already written it. And that research helps me to get close. The plotting is an attempt to kind of come, up, come around it and start digging around. And then when I actually am in there, that's when I discover what, you know, what that gem is, what that treasure is. And it always unfolds during the writing process at some point. And it always, I think it's actually part of what keeps me going as a writer. 14 books on, I'm still really excited about writing because it's a process of discovery for me. And I'm never quite sure what I'm going to find until I'm in it. Now, I know if you spoke to HarperCollins, they'd probably be like, Tara, could you plot a little harder? Could you write a little faster? Because maybe I could be a book a year writer. I never have been. Um, it's a couple of years for me, often with books, a year and a half at minimum. Maybe I could be one of those book a year authors. But I think the pantsing process possibly doesn't lend itself well to that. And I'm just naturally going to be someone who enjoys the process of discovery. I want to be as surprised as you are when you read it. You know, I want to go, oh, this is so cool. And, and I want that delight as I'm writing the scene. So if I worked it out beforehand, I feel like it would kind of never quite works for me in the writing process. They'll do this, and then they'll do that. I admire it so much in other writers, but I'm just not a plotter. Uh, thank you, Tara. Uh, from my point of view, I am also a pantser. And um, uh, what really struck me about what you said is this whole idea of discovery. Um, it, First of all, uh, I've never been inclined to make outlines. I never successfully did it in school. I never successfully taught it for the years I taught English at high school because uh, in my mind, it kind of limits what, um, you know, it put, somehow puts in boxes for me, definitely not for other people. I see its advantages enormously. Um, and also because I started writing my first book when I was 64. And I really felt that if I was going to spend the waning years of my life writing from plot point to plot point, it was not going to be an interesting process for me. Um, I, what I love about writing is the actual creativity of it. So when I sit down every day, I never worry about what's going to happen because something will. And like for Tara, for me, it's a discovery. What is my character thinking? What is she going to do? Uh, oh my God, she's doing that. I better go along with her, that kind of thing. So, um, but I will say that the, you, you mentioned the, the muddle in the middle. Uh, I think this is fairly common for pantsers is that they get fairly well in and then go, oh my God, what's going to happen now? And I remember going uh, to my husband who is happily reading or watching a soccer game or something. And I said, I don't know what to do. I've painted myself into a corner. And he said, uh oh, pants are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> that was very clever. Um, and so, uh, yes, that is, uh, I think one of the disadvantages of but for I remember uh, I, I did a panel with both um, um, Anne Cleves and another one with uh, with um, uh, Elizabeth George and Elizabeth George is a multi-layer plotter the big plot all the little plots all the characters and like it's a really massive job of work before she starts Donnelly Leon just says oh, I don't like outlining anything I just start writing so there you are. Um, I would like now to ask a little bit about the nitty gritty. Um, how many here are uh, interested in writing, are writer, writers themselves? So, and I imagine there's quite a few out there. So I think this might be helpful and useful, uh, especially if you're thinking of switching sides. So can we get a little bit into the nitty gritty? Um, you're sitting down to write, you want to write the great Canadian mystery. Uh, what is it that you actually do when you sit down? 
uh, either at the beginning of the book or the middle of your book? How do you use the, the plotting material that you've developed? Uh, let's start with you. Okay. Well, I'll just talk a little bit about maybe the first, the first how I approached the first draft. Um, and that's that uh, I, I, I continue to do what I started uh, doing, which was I'd heard that a thousand words a day was a good place to start. And so I have my idea now, I have my outline and all that stuff. But in the beginning, I, I didn't. I, although I, had, I knew my characters and I knew where I wanted to go generally. And so I, 1,000 words a day minimum. And, and so I wrote that to the best of my ability, which takes you know, a couple, couple of, two to three hours. And <clears throat> leave it alone. The next day, I go back to that and I, I look at that. But I don't start. I don't revise any of it. I just build, I just look. I read what I wrote yesterday, and then I just continue on from there. And I try not to be too critical. Um, I come from a screenwriting background before that, and I know I know there's so many uh, writers, and probably this is true of novels as well, who get started on something and just can't finish it. They're too critical. They don't get past the first couple of pages, the first chapter. They keep going back and reworking it. So you know they never they never progress past that point. And I believe in just kind of driving through. Uh, non-stop non building momentum and so that's my that's really my my simple process and that that's something that I think I will retain um, um, a lot of my uh, some of my favorite authors do the same thing Mike, Michael Connolly does a little bit differently where he he does a day's work however many words that works out to be pages um, and then he goes back the next day or later that day and, and revises what he wrote earlier and then builds upon that that might be interesting that'd be a slower way for me to go about it but that's an idea that I'm toying with as, as, as well. So that's, that's, that's definitely part of my process. Not being too terribly self-critical, especially in the first draft stage of clunky sentences. All that stuff can be fixed later on. It's tempting to, to, to dive into that and start reworking little things, little details, and without getting to the meat of the, the story. So that's, that's something that's helpful, that's been helpful to me. Great. Uh, Liz, tell us about your sort of the nitty gritty of your process. Well, usually my process, I kind of, I, I start out pantsing actually, um, usually. I, especially if I have a new story idea, I mean, for a series that I've been writing for a while, I know the characters and I know their voices. Um, but some, oftentimes if I'm starting out a new idea, I'll write the first 10 pages to see if it's the characters that I had in my head are speaking to me. And then once I feel like, okay, I, I can hear these people, I know, I know this is what I want to do. I'll, um, after I've written a chapter, say, um, and kind of set it up, I'll go back and I actually have, I have forms. <laughs> I have little worksheets that I can, I have a, 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 a worksheet for doing a one, one page synopsis. So sometimes I'll just try to do a, a very general one page synopsis. Like this is going to be a story about this person this happens to her, this is what her nemesis, this is her, her obstacle that she has to overcome, and this is how it's going to end. And then I would go back and uh, start filling in more detail into a longer synopsis. And that process can take anywhere from you know, a week to a month um, that I'll be sitting around just kind of letting it percolate. And then I'll start writing the book. Um, usually after that. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit curious. Um, <laughs> I, I remember hearing a, a pantser uh, was asked a question about what happens when one of your characters wants to do something different uh, from what you have outlined for them to do. And this author said, absolutely not. I beat them right back into place. Mm -hmm. So I actually wonder uh, for you as you're going along, looking at your outline and thinking, this is what's going to happen with your character. This is what they're going to do. Uh, do you hit a moment where you just feel like that's not right and I have to change it? I recently wrote a book where um, I had it all outlined. I had sold it on the outline. I, I was ready. I was. 50 pages into it. It was, um, it's actually not a mystery. It's, it was a kind of paranormal romance about witches. And so uh, I was writing along about my little witch character or whatever. And um, I just realized this, it was just, there's something missing. It was just death because the whole setup was that this person, she was, she didn't know if she was from a witch family or they couldn't practice witchcraft. And so 
Um, I just I thought I am writing a witchcraft book about somebody who doesn't practice witchcraft, which is just not working. And so I thought she has to have a mentor. There has to be somebody teaching her who she is. And and so um, at that point, I can't believe you didn't call me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I um, um, if I only known you were right there. Um, uh, so at that point, I thought she has to have this other character in the book, and it changed the book completely. You know, it changed the tone because suddenly there is this kind of wacky, very forceful person in the book. You know, moving the plot in a very different direction. And so at that point, I stopped and I had to replot the book because that's. You know, I have no self-confidence that if I don't read the book, that I'll get to the end that I want to get to. So, um, yeah. So I do. I plot. <laughs> uh, do you have any characters who misbehave and want to go off in their own direction? Oh God, yes. Um, the part of the fun of, of this series is is the character of Sloane Donovan. And I, I, I mentioned I wrote a kind of short story um, before I started the novel, and her voice came ready made to me. She's kind of a, a composite of a bunch of um, women that I work with in the, in the fitness industry. And uh, she's got her issues for sure. And um, But she's a hell of a lot of fun. And, and she's a wild card. I, I don't know what she's going to do next. So it's it's difficult to pin her down in, a, in an outline. But it, the whole book is, is written first person. So uh, everything is from Sloan's POV. Um, but I will touch a little bit on, on my third, on the, what happened in the third novel. And so I, I had this outline. The, novel, the book's a little bit more complicated. Uh, her arc is is changing, and um, there's really uh, multiple plot lines woven in there. So the outline was helpful to some degree for that. But um, when I sat down to write the first draft, I realized when I got to the the the, client, the third act, the conclusion, um, it was it all made sense. It was well well designed. It was it was very but it was very contrived, and it felt overly plotted and um, and boring, frankly. But yet I wrote it anyways because I couldn't see a better way to do it at the time. I thought well, I'll fix this up in, in round two. And so I wrote, I wrote the thing, and didn't really enjoy it, uh, the process. And then I went back and, and I, I reread it. And went, yeah, that, that's got to go. Like that's just, I had to deviate in some really major ways. I had to take some risks and just go, okay, now forget about what the logical thing is. What would Sloan do in this case? What, what are the what are the bad guys? They're not necessarily going to behave in the most logical fashion. What, what would these people like? Let's get into into their heads a little bit. I had to, I had to take a step back and and really um, and not not revise the outline. But just kind of punch out in a, in a new, fresh direction. That's uh, very interesting. So uh, let's hear from you, Tara, just about your process. Um, uh, you know, on a on a day to day writing basis. Well, it's a pleasure to be here around other human beings. <laughs> My day to day process doesn't involve a lot of, of, of uh, real life people. That's one of the worlds of a, an author that you sign up for. Um, I, I get up each day, coffee is always involved, um, and I sit down, and at the moment um, I'm using Scrivener, a piece of software that helps me to shift scenes around, especially being a pantser, I know we often associate software with plotters, um, I'm terrible at the plotting part, like I said, but the pantsing is helped by this because when I'm writing in Word, I go back 23 years now, so it used to be just you had a dirty old Word document that was 400 pages long, and I, um, I read and reread it, which I would always do hundreds of times during the writing process. If I'm reading that book and I'm like, oh, I think this section needs to go here, I would literally cut, cut and paste. So I like paste this huge section and, and move it hundreds of pages forward, sometimes lose it in the way, and then have to reopen the document from scratch, like ridiculous uh, process. So software like Scrivener is helpful for me because I can shift the scenes around to get the flow. For me, um, capturing the readers right away is really important, and so suspense and pacing is key. And when I'm writing about a character like Billy Walker, and it's the 1940s, it's such a rich atmosphere for subverting film noir, for subverting hard-boiled, for subverting that really um, male perspective that we've got in a lot of that, uh, you know, the, the, the crime fiction that has kind of set the stage for the genre. And doing that is going to be very character-driven, it's going to be research-driven, but that plot and suspense is still extremely important. Um, so for me, I'm always watching for that. 
But when I sit down at the computer, I will have my mind filled with um, you know, all of the research I've immersed myself in, whether it's, like I said, being you know, spending time with the FBI at the FBI Academy, or whether it's being on a crime scene. It, it, that is all kind of part of my world, and I'm able to bring that fairly effortlessly to the page. It kind of flows. Um, so for me, getting close to the action in real life is a way to make the writing process easier. It's a way to inspire, but also a way to come. It just flows when I'm at the computer. <coughs> I also aim for that thousand words a day. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a really tough 300, and sometimes it's 3,000. And the thing is, when the flow happens, just, just go with it. And, um, you know, people who are my friends, my husband, for example, my daughter as well, they're going to know when um, I'm in the flow because the rest of the world around me falls apart and, you know, things aren't getting picked up and I'm, you know, you know, I've forgotten to eat and, you know, there's more and more coffee happening. But it's where a lot of the best work is happening. So that's, that's Panzer's world, right? When it flows, that's kind of a Panzer thing. But all the plotting and research is actually necessary, I think, to create the foundations of the world that you're going to step into. Um, I definitely don't start a book just with blank page going, I don't know what I'll write, and just start. It's already percolated in my mind for a while. And Billy Walker in particular, who's a kind of amalgam of amazing women from the 1940s, like you know Nancy Wake, who's the most um, decorated allied uh, servicewoman, uh, Virginia Hall, who was a spy as well, very decorated. She was disabled as well. She had a a wooden uh, prosthetic leg called Cuthbert. Uh, these incredible women who did amazing things at the time um, had that resilience and were ordinary people, if you will, during extraordinary times and did extraordinary things. They're the people who inspire these books. And subverting the genres I love, like hardboiled and noir, is, is where the inspiration comes from. So it's more diverse, so it's more interesting. You've got queer characters in Paris. You've got you know, indigenous characters in Australia doing, you know, PI work. Like, it just, it, it's re more real to me. It's more authentic and it flows a lot better. Um, and you're, again, you're taking a genre that often has a lot of, it's got a framework and a formula to an extent, and you're shaking it up and giving it something fresh. And I think like you're saying, I know, you need to have that sense of, like, discovery and newness and freshness. And, and that's what I aim for. Sometimes, it was a very bad week where none of the freshness comes, just doesn't flow, and another week where it's incredibly uh, rewarding because the, my fingers are just flying. That's that's the world of uh, Panzer Taramox. Anyway. Thank you very much. Um, I really do see uh, quite a lot of similarities uh, between what you and I do and our kind of the, the approach to it. Uh, for me, as a Panzer, I it's a little bit, um, it's not quite true to say I just sit down uh, at the beginning of a book with a blank piece of paper. The first one, yes. So my main character, Lane Winslow, is a retired uh, spy from the SOE, and she's living as far away as possible in the Kootenays um, to just sort of put the whole war behind her. And that's actually inspired by my mother, who had many uh, characteristics including uh, doing espionage during the world, uh, during the war, not uh, in Europe, but in South Africa, where she and my father were living at the time. Uh, I do have a grandfather and three great uncles who all work for MI6, uh, worked, uh, they're dead now. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's something that fascinates me. And the whole idea of, um, how characters behave within historical situations uh, really fascinates me. Uh, and I just want to say in a, as an aside, you know, we're just at the tail end of a massive historical situation. So we're getting to see a lot about how people behave in historical situations for sure. Um, I think I, you know, for me, uh, you know, my writing process is I get my cup of tea, I uh, read the New York Times, and then I just sort of start writing whatever it is uh, for the day. I aim for about 1,500 words. Sometimes I get eight difficultly drawn out, and sometimes I get 2,000 just, uh, wow, just came. Um, 
I do have a couple of rules for myself, and it was a little bit, uh, Jeremy, like you were saying. Uh, one of my rules is I never make a judgment about what I've written uh, on the day. So I'll do my writing. I may write something that I think is like the worst cliche ever, and how could I even have written that? But I have a rule. You cannot backtrack and get rid of it because you don't actually know. You cannot make a judgment, in my view, uh, about something that's freshly written. So I go the next day. I reread what I've written. If that cliche is there and it's still awful, I can take it out. Uh, but sometimes I go, oh, I wrote that? It's brilliant, uh, you know, because you can't really tell. So that's one of my rules. And the way that helps me is that if I were to keep stopping, looking at what I've written, backtracking, second guessing myself, um, I believe it actually interferes with how your brain works in creativity. I think what happens is when your brain thinks you want anything it's got to offer, which you just sort of mainline as you're writing, um, then it's happy. If you start going, nah, I'm not sure about that, and you're going backtracking, your brain starts going, okay, you don't want that, you must want this. So I, I don't know. I, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I don't know. But I, for me, I feel like that's how it works. So uh, that is very critical for me. And my books, I feel, are very, very much character driven. I had a professor at uh, UBC who said, you can tell uh, who people are by how they behave. And, uh, you know, that's such a simple little sentence, but it really uh, hit home for me. So I'm very interested in the behavior of my characters and what they're doing at, at any given time, because I think it helps to direct what they're willing to do as you get towards the, um, you know, sort of climax of the story itself. All right. Um, how is our time? One, one, yes, one please. I just want to make one comment about um, creativity and where it comes from. So plotting or, plant or pantsing, whatever framework you put your creativity on is there to support you. And that's why you do it that way. If it doesn't work for you, you find another way, right? So there's no right or wrong way to write a book as long as you write it. And, and I always say as well, don't write it right. Just write it and make it right later. So give yourself the freedom to 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 flow. Like like you were saying, don't stop and criticize yourself. Let it flow. Let it go. I think everyone here would agree with that. One of the curious things, though, I find about the passing side of things, with um, you're really dealing in a way, you're writing in a way, pretty directly from your subconscious, from that kind of well of creativity that, as a human beings, we've always tried, you know, aim to understand and never quite can pin down. And what I will find sometimes is I will write something and I'll be getting closer towards the end. I'll be three quarters of the way through a book I've worked on for a year or something. And I'll be like, that bit goes with that. Oh, I hadn't put that together before. My subconscious actually knew that character was going to do this thing at that moment. And now I've got this thread that ties its way through. It's sort of backwards, but recognizing the patterns after they've come out through the creative flow is a thing I experience regularly. Can I predict it and rely on it? Of course not, which is why plotting is a, is a more sensible way to go forward. But those patterns can still be there. So our subconscious is very interesting that way. And I think uh, giving yourself the freedom to find out which method works for you, tap into that, it is a, it's a really good way to move forward. Because writing should be fun, first and foremost. Like You should want to do it. Otherwise, I'll be honest with you, you won't. Or you'll get through one very tough book and you won't write a second. So make sure you you uh, you let it spark joy, if you will, in whatever way it works for you. Uh, yes, uh, very uh, sound words. I just wanted to comment that I also use Scrivener for the same reason you do, because I can move uh, chunks around without too much difficulty. And I do get books back from my editor saying, you know, this has happened way too early. You need to move it. And of course, when you move a large chunk of something somewhere else, um, which your father probably already had in the right place. Um, you know, you have to rewrite so much behind it. Um, so, you know, you do, that kind of leads to the questions of advantages and disadvantages, which I want to get to. I do want to say that uh, one of the things that I always start out with is a singular image. 
So for my first book, it was the image of my mother buying this house that I actually lived in as a child. And if you know my work, you know the house really well um, because I live there. And uh, a, a, another book was just uh, a dead guy floating in a in a rowboat. And another book was somebody dying, you know, floating in a, in a swimming pool. So it's just that image. That's all I've got when I start. Um, but I may have broader ideas uh, about what I want to write about. Like, for example, the Sudetenland refugees. I don't know what I'm going to say about that, but I've just read about it and looked into it and read books by people who were there. And so now I want to see how that's going to work. And I have this one image of the dead guy in the rowboat. And all the work is what connects those two things. So I would like to ask uh, now about... Um, the benefits and disadvantages of your particular method as you see them. Can we dig a little deeper there? Uh, Liz, let's start with you. Oh, sorry, I don't need to pass that around all the time. <laughs> well, the disadvantages, like I said, are that you can, I mean, the things you're talking about, the, the wellspring of creativity and getting lost, I mean, sometimes, <clears throat> occasionally, it can feel like you're just slogging through, you know, like, Hitting the marks, you know. But um, I, I have a feeling I would feel like that anyway if I were even just panting. You know, um, I I feel like it, if anything, and just knowing that I've got the framework there allows my my brain to percolate a little more freely. And sometimes I will hit a spot. Almost like you were saying, where you, you you suddenly realize, oh, there's a connection here. I'll realize that in my outline, I've written a connection, and I didn't really quite realize it at the time. You know, like, oh, this is happening, and 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 this fits with this, and you know, it's it's a great thing. Um, the disadvantage is often I'm writing to deadline for a publisher because I've I've been a working writer for my whole adult life, and so I, you know, I I write on a schedule. And I'm usually writing the deadline. <clears throat> and so sometimes, um, like, I just turned in an outline for my 47th book. The uh, publisher already has the cover for the 47th book. Wow. So, and they have the, and they have, you know, they needed the outline so they could write the back cover copy. So at this point, I pretty much have, like, all of the, the framework. It has to, I can't deviate too much because it's, you know, I can't make the publisher do a cover. So um, so it frees you up, but can lock you in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I too. am locked in a little bit. I mean, I try to keep things as vague and, you know, the cover, the cover copy is usually pretty vague. Um, but I try to uh, make it as vague as possible so that, you know, like, if I like don't mention specific names too much. Um, so things like that. I know, it's monstrous. 47 books. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I know. Jeremy, you're falling behind. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, advantages and disadvantages from your point of view? Um, well, one very practical advantage for me personally is um, I have a horrible memory. Um, so, for instance, when I, when I wrote the first draft of the first novel, um, you know, I started introducing these cool characters who come to me and, and um, and I would completely forget about them. Um, and I would just try to drive through it so, so some plots would get lost and things like that. Uh, there would have been benefit to, beneficial to have taken more notes um, along the way, uh, done up a rough outline or something that I didn't, didn't have one initially. So there's that advantage. Um, I'm blown away by, by um, authors who, who, who use no outline, no notes, and, and just go for it. And they end up with these incredibly complicated stories. I don't think I have the capacity to do that to me, to be honest. I think uh, I get lost. So <clears throat> there's that. That's that's a definite advantage, advantage to it. The disadvantage, um, as I as I look to write more books, is keeping the the spark the spark alive with with that, and and not having it become a paint by numbers kind of a kind of a thing. You get kind of better at doing the outline. Okay, here's the story. It's it's seems kind of form, formulaic, but here we here we go. It's logical. It makes sense. It gets the job done. And uh, but yet somehow the, the fun gets. For me, is starting to get stripped away in that in that process. 
So I'm, what, what I'm going to do before I get it, I'm still working on the third one, so I'm getting, I'm getting too far ahead of myself, but um, I'm going to write a short story with no outline, just an idea in my head and an outline, no outline, and see what happens out of that. Because even my short stories, I do outlines now. So I'm going to scrap, I'm going to scrap it, I'm going to use it as a confidence builder and see what happens, and then, and then, uh, and then take it from there with the fourth one. You've committed publicly now. Yes. <laughs> That's very exciting. Um, Tara, advantages and disadvantages from your point of view. I think all of the stuff that you were talking about, Liz, you know, I, I write to deadlines with publishers and um, I try to give myself as much uh, space on that contract as possible, but um, I don't cram at the end. I've already been like immersed for a couple of years, but there's always a really difficult like four months or so before the delivery of the book. Like it's inevitably, I imagine in my aspiration towards a plotter that that would not happen, that I would have plotted everything in such a way that, you know, when I've finished six months ahead and I can look back and maybe have a, you know, a cursory look through the book and go, it's wonderful and send it in. It's never like that. It's, it's like I'm still figuring stuff out in the final months before the delivery of the book even though like five publishers are waiting on it around the world. It's very anxiety inducing. And so there are definitely downsides. Um, but try as I might in 23 years, I haven't managed to shift my process very much. I, I think I'm, I'm getting better at my process. I'm certainly better at my craft. And I think my books have improved. But that kind of the way creativity works for me just has not been something that's shifted very much despite uh, my efforts to you know, put, I've got walls of pages and, you know, arrows and things and trying to, it, it, it just ends up, the characters tell me what they're going to do, and I'm a, I'm a good writer and I do what I'm told sometimes, you know. As a historical writer, though, I mean, when you're, when you're pantsing along, yeah. uh, do you ever hit uh, a kind of research wall where you think, oh, now I've got to stop? And, and and deal with this research and figure out what you have actually could have happened. Uh, yes, I, I mean, it sounds like you do a lot of your research ahead of time. I do a lot ahead of time and it's not plotting, it's actually just collecting information. So I have a place in Scrivener where I've got all these articles and everything that I want. But uh, I remember listening to Ian Rankin talk and he said he writes along, he's got the scene in his mind as he's writing and then he hits that point and he stops and he goes and looks up what he has to and then uh, changes it uh, if need be. Uh, and I certainly have done that. And I think a lot of, because I, in my view, I write very much from what is a human going to do in this situation? Um, I'm always looking at probabilities. In this situation, this is some probable behavior I might expect from the people in my stories. And so I can often write through that uh, and then go back and just make sure. I mean, my thing is I never want to fill my book with tons of historical uh, data because it just makes people's eyes water. Um, but uh, I want to have enough there to create the scene and the tone and the feel, and I want it to be right. And I've been proven uh, right in doing this. I've had letters from people um, whose families um, you know, we're Sudeten land refugees in the Peace River uh, who said to me, wow, this is like listening to my dad talk. And I'm just so grateful that I made sure that whatever I put there, not a lot, but it's right. Yeah. Incredibly important to get the research right. And being obsessed as I am, of course, it's it feels like it's half my job as a historical writer. I know, I mean, it's historical mystery, so it's still character driven and suspense driven in many ways. But when Billy Walker picks up a telephone, and I, I, I see it in my mind, it, it leaps forward as it's a it's a pink telephone in this side room. I have to go. Oh, wait a moment. Did they have secondary phone? Could they have a second phone line in that apartment in this period? And actually, that will be some of my research. Will be the most tiny little things that the vast majority of people wouldn't pick. Is that possible or not? You know, when Billy Walker walks into the Hotel Ritz Paris in her silk trousers, well, guess what? She, they're going to ask her to leave because trousers were banned in Paris and they actually enforced that rule in, in the Ritz at that point. So 
stopping and doing that extra bit of research makes for a more interesting book, actually. But it does mean that you you are um, things will flow, and then occasionally I'm like, now I can't picture it anymore because I'm not sure whether that's physically possible. Did, did that device exist in that form at the time? Should we, could she walk into that room at the time? And like you said, the sense of responsibility to family. And you know, I had my Oma and Opa living in the Netherlands when it was occupied by the Nazis, and my Opa taken into slave labor by the Nazis and put into a work camp. I feel a really strong responsibility to them and people of their generation um, to get a lot of really correct detail without weighing the book down. But boy, you gotta get it right. So if you go on a tangent pantsing, and, and the whole premise is wrong, you're going to waste a lot of time and maybe you'll miss it when it comes to publication and it'll, it'll find its way in. Uh, and may I hasten to add that there is always somebody out there who is very willing to put you right. Uh, you will get letters. Uh, uh, I see the time, my God, it flies when you're having a really such an interesting discussion. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are any questions from the audience for any of our authors. Yes. I do, and it's a general question. Um, I'm curious about the process um, between if you're going from your first draft to your second draft. Because, you know, my inclination initially is to leave Campbell. Right? You write this beautiful story, you've got everything there, and then all of a sudden you go, now I've got to make it, I've got to change it, I've got to make it different, you know, because it's, there's too much in it, you know, like my, my middle means I've been adding a lot more stuff to the middle. So how do you, do you, at that point, do you ever cross into, if you're a pantser, do you ever cross into plotting at that point? Or what do you do? So the question was about uh, what goes on between your first draft and your second graph, draft, and do you then become the other person? Do you pants or plot, uh, depending on who you are, in order to make that transition to a better draft? Would you like to take that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so when I look at my, my first uh, novel, um, there was a big a big change because that first draft was, was un, unplotted. Um, and then I took a course and, and Deborah advised me to outline. So then I drew up that, the outline, and that was essentially in my second draft. So that was that was like starting over again. Um, but um, what what I do now is that um, I get that first draft out there. I let it sit for a little while, get some perspective on it, work on something else, come back to it, and then I, I then I, I read it straight through without changing anything. I just I take notes along the way. I try to read it as though I didn't write the thing, and and with what and and. I'm looking for not so much grammatical errors and things, but but big things that, that jump out, inconsistencies, uh, whole scenes that are just garbage or, or whatever. And I'm ruthless, and so and then and then I sit I, I sit down and then I I have those those key points, uh, those need to be addressed, the big stuff, and then and then I go out and then I go after it that, that way. Liz, what about you? Um, well, the big thing is <clears throat> to try to look at the manuscripts that you've just written in as objective a way as possible, which is really hard. But my background is, the only really writing background I had was in theater. So in playwriting, when you're, you finally get a play up on its feet, um, it's very clear like, where it's not working because it's dead. Like you feel just this kind of dreadful doom of, of lifelessness up on the stage. And it's just it's so deadly, so awful. Um, and so when I'm reading, I kind of, I'm kind of like trying to see it as if it were in a three-act structure on a stage. Like, what, what isn't working? Where, where are the dead places? Where are people doing things that aren't motivated? And that's really a lot of what it is. It's, is are these people motivated to be doing what they're doing in every scene? Are there people in scenes who have no reason to be there, who are just there being the friendly person in the scene? Or, you know, you know, just um, make sure that every everything is following a cause and effect um, plot line, uh, through line to the end. Um, and that's that's like the only real advice I have. It's a hard. The second draft is is hard because it really does often just 
kind of wither your soul. Look at what you've just done. <laughs> you see withered souls here. Um, so in both cases, it's about going back and reading and assessing what you've got. I have uh, two beta readers that I use uh, who are extremely good at going, uh, why is this policeman not asking this question kind of thing? And you go, oh, oh my goodness. So that can be very helpful. What about you, first to second draft? I'm going to be a little bit from left field here and say that I actually don't really write in drafts. I, as a pantser, um, the process of discovery means that I start with skeletons, but actually going to dead places. <laughs> Looking for the dead places in the book energetically, yes. Going for the dead places in, to write about is absolutely where I go. But I'm, I'm starting with a skeleton and fleshing it out often. So scenes on my first go through will often be um, too skeletal because a lot of the idea is still in my head and not yet on the page. It sort of hasn't fully formed yet. Um, but I can see the scene, and to me, it's completely fully formed, and I have to like write it out. And when um, it comes to sending the book, again, a year or longer later, to the publisher, so a lot of time has passed, they might actually notice that I haven't written something that I think is there because of that pantsing. You know, like, I can see the scene, and they'll say, well, why are they doing that? I'm like, well, because of this, of course. And they're like, oh, good, you should probably, you know, make that a little bit more clear. So. Drafts are not something that I do in a, a formal way. I don't go from start to finish and then go back and, and write another draft version of it. It's more like the archaeologist going, you know, using the finer brush as I get closer to the end until everything is just, just so. And I can tell it's right when, um, gosh, when I can just tell. You know, when you read the scene and you're like, yeah, that it's it, it the scene serves a purpose, all the characters are there for a reason, it's propelling the plot forward, it flows, and it feels right, and there's no clunky dialogue, there's no bits that are missing. And so yeah, for me it's a little bit the opposite to a lot of authors I know, in that I tend not to trim my scenes back as I edit, I tend to add to them uh, because I write a little bit backwards from that kind of discovery perspective. Uh, well, I think it's interesting to see um, uh, that there are some similarities mm -hmm. in, pants, in plot, uh, pantsers and plotters in terms of how they work, mm -hmm. because I would say I also do not do uh, drafts. I write my book and then I go back and I add, subtract, move chunks around in that book. So it's a very different process. So I was quite yeah. relieved to hear you say that. Yeah. Um, can, can I also just please. quickly note that our pantsers are wearing skirts today and our plotters are wearing pants. Oh. And that just goes to show you we're all, we're all really a bit of both. That is so true. Um, I want to, um, I'm looking uh, at our showrunner here. Do you want to ask him another question? Uh, have we got time for another yeah, question? Yeah, Okay, uh, do we have another question from the floor? Yes. Um, for, for those of us who are writing this full-time job, full-time job, writing job, we try to figure out writing a fairly limited amount of time, do you find that having a detailed outline helps with getting into your writing session to save you a certain amount of time, or are you kind of useful? So the question was about if you have a full-time job, but you also want to write, whether uh, having an outline would actually help. And I just want to say, I wrote my first book uh, when I was a uh, high school principal of a major East Side high school. Uh, and my uh, uh, plan was to write 400 words a day, no matter what. So that was my pantser approach. Let's hear from a full-time working, do you have a job outside or are you just a writer now? Yeah, okay, yeah, why don't you yeah, talk yeah, to um, yeah, so, <laughs> I've always kind of worked part-time. Oh, 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 part-time oh, as a yeah. personal trainer. And I still, I still do. It's a great job because I can, I can make my own hours for that. Um, I work really, I, I get my writing done first thing, um, really early, which I get four or five in the morning and, and get, and get after it. <clears throat> um, uh, an outline can help actually, um, because you can kind of sit, sit down. Okay, where am I going with this next? It does. There's, there's a confidence aspect, aspect to it. And if you commit it to the, the outline, the story's there, and um, it's a little bit like filling in the, filling in the gaps, but. But um, that it can be it can be helpful. It can sort of hold you 
accountable. You know, it'd be like um, setting on a road trip to, to New York with a, with a map. It helps, helps to have a map. You know, like, where am I going? Okay, I have a big idea of how to get, you know, head east. But um, it's, it's helpful to have a blueprint, especially if you, it, it's, uh, it, can't, it can't hurt. And then if you decide at some point, I want to deviate, I'm going to have some fun, screw the outline, get, get rid of it. If it, if it serves you, you, you'll know it. If it doesn't, it'll be obvious. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful, wonderful uh, panel colleagues, Liz and Jeremy and Tara and myself. Thank you. You can uh, find these wonderful books uh, either at the publishing tables or at the uh, bookstore which is out there somewhere. I haven't located it. And you may or may not find us at the signing tables as well uh, if you want your book signed. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.